Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe Salcihai, co-host of today's show. And I'll explain the microphone quality here in a minute, but I wanted to jump in before we press play on this wonderful episode because I have two things for you. First, no profanity in today's show. We bleep out a minor word, so maybe there's some minor profanity, but I wouldn't be uh, coming in here at the beginning if we didn't have something incredibly disturbing at the beginning of today's interview. So I would avoid having young children listen to our featured interview today with Olympian and elite running star now NBC sports analyst Kara Goucher. So I would avoid young ears in the room, at least until you hear it. Second, I also need to pull back the curtain on how we constructed today's episode, because if I don't, we're going to seem pretty tone deaf when you hear that explosive part of today's story. So the topic of running and money interests me, and clearly I saw that Kara had written a book talking about some problems at a Nike's elite running team. And I thought this would be a great way to meld this uh, greedy side of money and the topic of money and running, uh, two topics that I love. So I reached out to co-author Mary Pallon, who's been on the show a couple times, to see if maybe Kara would come on. I was super excited when she referred me to Simon & Schuster, their publisher. But the publisher, because of the explosive part of this interview, which I did not know was coming, did not allow Kara to be available until Monday, It is now Tuesday night as I'm recording this. You're listening maybe on Wednesday morning. It's a very quick turnaround for a show like ours. So because of our travel schedules, I'm now in a hotel room in Indianapolis getting ready for an appearance as you're listening to this show on the Bob and Tom syndicated radio show. And OG is out with family in Colorado. So we recorded the rest of the episode ahead of time because we thought we knew what was coming and clearly We did not. And once I heard the whole episode uh, together, as we exit the interview with Kara, uh, we seem a little tone deaf. And that, frankly, is because we'd already recorded it and we had no idea uh, of the elephant in the room piece of this interview. It's a it's a wonderful interview. Kara Goucher was such a great guest. It's a it's a great episode, um, but a horrible story. So let's just get on with it. Here's today's Stacking Benjamins. And now we're pleased to bring you our feature presentation. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and who knew running could be such a dirty business? Today, with a look at life inside of Nike's elite pro running team, We welcome long-distance star and co-author of the new bestseller, The Longest Race, Kara Goucher. In our headline segment, the job market is cooling. What should your strategy be? We have ideas. And later, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky listener. And of course, I'll be sure to share some delectable trivia. That word makes me uncomfortable. And now, two guys who are helping you go the distance, Joe. Oh, and oh, j j j j g Hey there, stackers. Welcome to Wednesday, a delectable Wednesday, Doug. Why it probably delectable. is. Why wouldn't it be a delectable Wednesday? We have a delectable show so awkward. for you today. I'm going to say delectable a lot now. I am Joe Salcia. I average your money on Twitter. And man, do we have an action-packed Wednesday for you. But first, you heard the crooning of Mr. Doug, mom's neighbor Doug, but you haven't heard yet the man across the card table from me bringing it at the midweek. It's Mr. OG. How are you, my friend? What's good? Well, I'll tell you what's good. Kara Goucher coming down to the basement today. Long distance sensation is a guy that uh, about 100 pounds ago, I was a distance runner myself. (laughs) So I followed... (laughs) <laughs> is that a unit of time? Uh, I uh, I followed her career, and I'm I'm very 
excited to talk to her. Obviously, we're going to talk to her about some disturbing stuff going on inside of Nike. You know, money does strange things to people, as we've heard many times. Mom said that. Oh, (laughs) Kara Goucher's going to tell. We got some headlines to do, so let's move. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. Today's headline comes to us from the Wall Street Journal. It is written by John Hilsenrath, who is going to be on the show uh, fairly soon talking about economics. John writes, long, robust U.S. labor market shows signs of cooling. Oh, gee, we saw it in the tech sector last year. The rest of the economy looked pretty good. Life looked great. Your chance of losing your job at jobs outside the tech sector didn't look bad. Well, we might have some problems here. Uh, John writes, demand for U.S. workers show signs of slowing a long anticipated development that's showing up in private sector job postings, even while official government reports indicate the labor market keeps running hot. ZipRecruiter and Recruit Holdings, two large online recruiting companies, say their data shows the number of job postings is declining more than Labor Department reports of job openings. Investors recently hammered shares of those companies after disappointing earnings results. So do you think that because their earnings were down, they're like, hey, people need a job way more than the, than the government says you need a job? I don't think there's any conspiracy, any truth to that, do you? Con- conspiracy theories? I- I'm sorry, I'm a little distracted by Doug's very much like mad scientist hair that he's got going on right now. I just like, it's like, did you touch a light bulb or a light? Did you you're, put your finger in a light socket? Doug, you're, Doug, you're on mute again. I just, all I've been, I've just been laughing because out of embarrassment, I don't, I, I can't do anything else. This is all of the hair that there this is, is. This is like, this is, when you go to the science center and you put your hands on the thing and like all the electricity's around your hair stands up. I'll get it. I think this is just how disturbing this is how disturbing Doug finds this uh, job report. Yeah. Great save. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody that was saw pro through. level, man. <laughs> Nobody yeah. saw through that one at all. Yeah. Bring it yeah. back. Yeah. So are things getting tighter? You would think. Right? The economy's uh, a little different. The uh, profitability, all that sort of stuff, it's going to trickle down to to the employment level, I would imagine. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that's a great point, OG, that whether ZipRecruiter is onto something or not, certainly making yourself more marketable. This is just a great reminder for our stackers, right? Mm-hmm. Just just continually work on making yourself look attractive because you never know. How many times have we, over the last decade, heard people say to us, and now he has a hat. I was going to say, make ourselves look attractive, and Doug shows up with a hat on. He just goes and grabs, grabs a hat, but make yourself look more attractive because how many times over the past decade have people come on this show and say, I was surprised all of a sudden somebody's like, Hey, can you come down to my office? And you go in your boss's office and there's somebody from HR sitting in their office. Or on the compensation side, lots of studies have shown that once you get ingrained into a, you know, an organization, you kind of end up on the trajectory of you get your regular, regular air quotes, cost of living pay raises. Meanwhile, they're hiring people five, eight, ten percent uh, higher than you're at, just because that's the market. But you're not on the current market train, so you always got to be kind of looking around to see what's uh, whether or not you're being competitive. If you're being competitive in your skills, if you need to up those, or if your employer is being competitive, you know, in the compensation and benefits and all that sort of stuff. I found another piece on that note from Indeed.com. This is uh, written by the Indeed editorial team. Six ways to find your next job. And I think that this idea of sharpening the saw that you're on to OG is a a great thing for us to discuss, no matter what the conditions are right now. Number one, ask your network for referrals. I'm old enough to know. Number one thing, dust off that resume. I'll give you a a little thing here. Dust off your resume doesn't make the top six. It isn't even, nobody, resume is dead. Resume is gone. Network and referrals. I know somebody. Yeah. You know, you just have that conversation and you want to be that connector. The Never Eat Alone book, right, is all about just being that connector. Joe Polish, who's got a big following, his whole thing is, I want to be the person that everybody knows that can find the person that you need. 
Yeah. I mean, if you're somebody that's connecting other people, you're going to be the first person people call for anything, which is a great spot to be in because then they perceive that they owe you a favor. And now when you need something great to go back. So if you're, if your network isn't dusted off, if your LinkedIn profile is uh, you haven't looked at it in a while, you haven't built up some of these connections on the business front, probably a great place to start. Number two, contact companies directly. How about this one? Look at the companies that you want to work for, places you want to go and just say, hey, I, I, would love to, I would love to work for you. If a company you're interested in, this piece says, doesn't have any relevant jobs posted on their website, reach out to them via email or phone to see if they're looking to employ someone with your qualifications and experience. If a company's not actively recruiting for your role, they may keep you on file in case a position becomes available in the future. I don't know anybody who's done this, but it seems to me to be a great idea. I don't know the cold calling works. Doug, Doug looks like he's got an opinion about this. Doug but did it for this job. Doug, I did you do it for this job? I did. Doug I cold did. called us. Cold called us. But I think the um, combination of those first two probably makes the most sense, right? Network into the job or into the company that you want. So you're on LinkedIn and you go, I want to work with, you know, I want to work at Pepsi, but I don't have an in at Pepsi. Find somebody that does that you know, and then, you know, kind of work that angle. Doug, you know somebody that did this, or did you actually do this? Well, I tried it. I tried it once. There was a there was a job opening that I thought was a little beneath me, and so I but I applied for it, and uh, had a phone interview and talked about that. But said, you know, I'm really interested in this other role that I see that you have posted. And the guy's like, yeah, we kind of already have somebody in mind for that, but you know. Let's talk to you about this role anyway. So I kept talking about that role and they bring me in for an interview. And the first words out of my mouth when I sat down at the guy's desk was, so let's talk about that director role. And the guy's like, look, I told you once before we're wow. done. And he kicked me out of his office. That was it. <laughs> that was the end of it. A 30 second but interview. I'm like, I'm going for it. Cause they said, everybody says. And cut. And we're done. <laughs> yeah. Good day, sir. Did you say that? And okay, let's go back to the beginning <laughs> you of this. validate? <laughs> why are you wearing a tuxedo i got my yeti cup here with the lid do you guys have a coffee can i just grab a coffee on the way out <laughs> number three use job search platforms weird that indeed.com would say to use job search platforms weird wow. but very seriously i think that uh w whether it is indeed linkedin zip recruiter whatever it is job search platforms are kind of like the dating apps right now i mean it seems like that's the place all companies go like, how do you find, how do you find your employee? You don't go to the newspaper anymore. Sadly, newspaper people <laughs> love the newspaper, but who does that? Breaking news. <laughs> Newsprint is dead. Sometimes in our neighborhood, they will drop off free newspapers and you have to call to cancel it. Yeah. You're like, please, please stop. Please stop sending me. They're like, it's free. We're like, I'm like, no, it's not. It's, it's a, a pile of trash in the front of my house that I have to remember every so often to go clean. Like, please stop sending. I love the free newspaper because I have a solo stove. <laughs> well, I'll save them all for you and I'll bring them to you. Perfect. I got a use for them. I'll collect all my neighbors. We record too. for Friday. Bring those over, please. Uh -huh. Number four, go to job fairs. That's two things. OG. I think that's a networking opportunity and you're going to meet people. Doug looks dubious on that one, but I do like the networking aspect being, and, and they talk about this in the piece. Being face to face, eye to eye with somebody ahead of time might be a deeper connection than just going to indeed.com. Yeah. I don't know that there's a lot of job fairs post COVID, but maybe. Yeah. Number five leverage. Uh oh, this piece was written in 1887. Sorry. <laughs> now this is this is this is a new piece. And then uh number five leverage social media. I think we talked about LinkedIn. Number six, inquire at staffing agencies. Uh, we'll link to these in our show notes page at stackybedjamins.com. And I think we'll also dive deeper in the newsletter, the 201, which is always free. You can unsubscribe whenever you want to, but it's the place where we dive deeper into whatever we talk about on the podcast. Coming up next, when you think about professional sports, you think about money, but generally, OG, you're thinking about baseball, football, hockey, NBA, tennis. Golf. I can think of a lot of things I think of before I think of professional running. <laughs> like if I asked you to talk about dirty stuff happening in professional sports and in the name of money, where would professional running sit on your list? When would you finally get to it? I don't know that I would uh, think of running right behind curling. 
<laughs> I think it'd be a little ahead of curl. No offense to you curlers. I love me some curling, but for me, it's way ahead of time. Well, this is a woman coming up next whose career I followed for a long time. Kara Goucher, three-time NCAA champion, two-time Olympian, winner of the silver medal at the 2007 World Championships in the 10,000 meter in the 10,000 meters. <laughs> wow, she's fast. She's out of this world. <laughs> <laughs> and a podium finisher at the Boston and the New York Marathon. She's a running analyst for NBC Sports. She hosts the hit running commentary podcast, Nobody Asked Us. Of course, referring to another Olympian, Des Linden, who, by the way, Doug, uh, you see out running in your neck of the woods. Yeah, in my neck of the woods, literally. She, she doesn't live too far, and we have great training grounds, lots of hills around here, and she out doing some training. You know, for house. me, th those are the worst training grounds. I like it really, really flat. Always downhill. And always downhill, yes. Just a slight grade downhill. <laughs> but Kara might think differently about that. We're going to talk to her in just a moment, but Doug is a way to get there. I think we have some trivia first, right? Sure do, Joe. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I prefer speed walking to running, but that, that's just me. Not everyone's blessed with these swooshing hips I've got. Speaking of opting out, today's question is, in November 2019, the entire company of Nike opted out of selling products directly through what platform? I'll be back right after I hit the mall and break in these new walking shoes. They're so shiny and white. Hey there, stackers, I'm knee-high socks and short shorts wearing Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Want to know what platform all of Nike joined forces to stop selling their products on? It was Amazon. And now it's time to lace up for the longest race with Kara Goucher. Let's just do it. And I'm super happy she's coming down to mom's basement to talk about her career and so much more. Kara Goucher's here. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm nervous. Obviously, this is launch week, but I'm also ready for this to happen. I thought you're nervous because you're being interviewed in somebody's mom's basement for a podcast. I mean, that's like, part of it. It's a little weird. <laughs> what the hell am I but doing mostly here? it's good. <laughs> yeah. Where's my agent when I need them? <laughs> Kara, let's just get right to it. A 2022 piece from the New York Times written by Kevin Draper and Matthew Futterman details why famed Nike Oregon Project distance coach Alberto Salazar went from ban for four years for doping violations to ban permanently. And the piece reads that the United States Center for Safe Sport, an organization that investigates reports of abuse among Olympic sports, ruled that Salazar had committed four violations, including two instances of penetrating a runner with a finger, while giving an athletic massage. The name appropriately uh, by the New York Times, not mentioned. However, there's all these identifying characteristics. And I'm sure, Kara, there were so many people probably at the time going, there's only a small number of people it could have been. But I believe for the first time here, you're identifying publicly that at least one of those times was you. Yeah. Yep. And when that article was being written, it was one of the worst experiences of my life, if I'm being honest, because they wanted me to comment and I they legally couldn't run my name until I had commented and I was not ready to do that. It was interesting when that article ran, I thought that a lot of people would just connect the dots. But what I got were a lot of texts and emails from people in my life saying, wow, I that's so sad. I hope whoever that was is at peace. So it didn't you know, I was worried that people are going to connect the dots and just call, like, just point blank ask me. And that's not what happened, which I'm grateful for. Did you say anything to Alberto Salazar at the time when that happened? No, I said nothing. I was stunned. And honestly, I convinced myself it was a mistake. I don't, it, in so many instances like this, you always hear that where the person who has this happen to them goes, oh, it must have been a mistake. It must have been. But clearly, now that you've been able to put the dots together from a lot of different people, this was clearly not a mistake. Yeah. And, and understanding that and coming to terms with that took a long time because it's one thing to have a really kind of icky situation with your coach, but he's the great guy and he's a dad and you kind of put it aside as like, he's just a terrible massage therapist. And I don't want to, I felt bad. I felt bad that I thought maybe he had done something like that to me on purpose. 
And so for so many years, it sat in that box and that way it couldn't hurt me. It was like, oh, well, it was just an accident, an unfortunate accident. But but obviously, as I've gone through therapy and talked with people, I look at it differently, of course. And that was really hard for me to to reckon with. Well, and it put a pit in my stomach, Kara, when I was reading it, just you blaming yourself. And even later, uh, an email that you wrote or a letter that you wrote to Alberto talking about how he was such in a lot of ways, such a father figure and that he'd helped you so much. And clearly in a lot of ways he had, there were some things that he, that he had done that were fantastic for your career. And it just, even, even reading that. But what I'd like to do is, is I'd like to go back to the beginning because as I read your book, obviously this, this is a money show. Money is entwined in everything here, but your love of running did not start at all with, with money. Let's go back, actually, even before running to your parents. You have the most unlikely pairing of parents between your mom's family and your dad's family, but somehow they make it work next to a soccer field is where they meet. So sports looms large in your family, but you're living on the East Coast. Your family's headed to Duluth for a family a visit or a family reunion. Your dad has to stay behind to take care of some business. And when you get to Duluth, your mom gets a call. And I think how you, you're maybe, what, three years old at this time? Yeah, I was a week away from my fourth birthday. Yeah. Do you remember the call at all? You know, I don't. I can picture it, but only because I've been told this story so many times and because I grew up in my grandparents' house. I mean, we had our own house, but I was there so often that I can picture everything, but I don't remember. Um, there's a lot that I don't remember about that time. I, I just, you know, I was probably just too young to really remember. And, you know, it's interesting because I always felt like, oh, it didn't affect me that my dad died. I don't even remember. Um, but obviously now that I'm older, I'm like, oh no, that really affected me. And it really left me open to like seeking that father figure throughout my whole life. But also when my son turned four, I remember thinking if I were to die right now, he would, I have left an imprint on him. And in a weird way, that was healing because I, I realized that my dad has affected me and who I became. That your dad was killed in a car accident. How did, how did the accident happen? Um, he was driving to work and there was someone who had, was drunk and high. He actually jumped the mid, I don't even know what you call it. The median Um, or the... Yeah, the median and went airborne and landed on top of my dad's car. And he was killed instantly. And it was horrible. It was horrible. My mom had me and my sister who was a couple weeks from being six. And then my little sister who was only six weeks old. It just completely changed the trajectory of her life and of our lives and what, you know, growing up looked like. I just can't, just can't imagine your, your papa, which is what you called your grandfather, always said to you, if you see something wrong, make a plan to make it better. If you don't like it, fix it. I love that. So I'm guessing he must've told that to your mom because your mom immediately decides she can't do anything about your dad being dead, but she can try to set up a mothers against truck drivers in the area. So she goes to work on this. Was she successful? Oh yeah. She got the mad chapter done in for Duluth, Minnesota. And she was a big part of mad for many, many years of most of my childhood driving down to the Twin Cities a lot to host events. She was one of the main people that got victim impact panels. So if you get a DUI, you have to go in front of victims of drunk drivers and hear their stories. And she has worked so hard at that her whole life. She still does victim impact panels. And, you know, she modeled for me early on. And so did my grandpa about like, not don't complain, do something about it. And I really feel like I am my grandfather's granddaughter. I mean, through and through, like he really had a huge impact on me of you have power if you choose to do the right thing. And so he obviously had that influence on my mom as well. Well, that resonates throughout the book. Like your grandfather's imprint, Kara, is all the way through this project. So he became your first running coach, but let's talk about that. When did you start running and why did you start running? You know, my grandpa was a lifelong runner. He didn't race. He just liked to run. That is a sickness. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh, how much we bonded over our love of running. But he took me to my first race when I was six. 
it was like a mile run and he loved to tell the story. Oh my God, the people at his retirement community would literally roll their eyes because he would always tell the story. <laughs> but he brought me and I fell at the start and he worried that, oh my gosh, because I was kind of like a little wussy. And he thought, oh great, you know, she's going to cry. And instead I jumped up and was like, they're getting away from us. And he loved it because he realized I had this competitive spirit that he hadn't seen before. And I just wanted to be like him. So he was a runner and I wanted to be a runner, but I didn't realize there was organized running teams at that time in my life. It was just something I did. Maybe I'd be out at the cabin and run with him a little bit, or there'd be some kids race and he or my mom would enter me. And it wasn't until middle school that I realized you could actually like do this as a sport. Well, and I loved in middle school, you wrote that you had to run against Scott, who at that time, (laughs) Kara, was the love of your flipping life. Like this guy was, was whatever happened to Scott, by the way, how come Scott's- Oh my gosh, this is so crazy. So I'm at Nike as a Nike athlete. And one day I'm like, I swear I just saw my childhood like absolute obsession. And then it turned (laughs) out that he was interning and then he got a job at Nike and then we was Adam ended up jealous? Doing, was Adam jealous? He wasn't. He should have been, but he wasn't. Yeah, right. Your seventh great crush is back. <laughs> but yeah, no, he's such a great guy. And then even the, the last few years I lived in Oregon, we would go on runs together. Like he ran Boston in 2011 when I ran Boston in 2011. Wow. So it's just the world is wild. Life is wild. But you had fun then. You had fun in middle school. You got promoted. You said because of school budget cuts, you got promoted to the high school team. And immediately you're seeing success as a runner. And it seems like your freshman and sophomore year, you're having a lot of fun. But that changes your junior and senior year because you start to put pressure on yourself. My daughter, by the way, Kara, ran for the University of Arkansas. But her her senior year, she put so much pressure on herself. What would you say to these high school athletes listening to this that do you know, it becomes so much less. I remember for my daughter, sometimes her senior year of high school became so much less about fun and what she'd loved before and almost a a sickness because of how competitive we are. Yeah. It's a slippery slope, right? Because you want to be as competitive as you can be and you're dedicating so much time and effort to it, but then it can spiral out of control where you lose, like you lose the love of the journey because you're so worried about the destination. You're so worried it about like you were the having result. no fun your senior year in high no. school. And then, you know, that happened to me multiple times throughout my career. I, I just really had to, fo- like, if I hadn't had such incredible teammates, we wouldn't be talking right now because I just would have been like, this isn't fun. I hate it. I'm not as good as I used to be. I'm letting everyone down. Every race is a disappointment. And I didn't have the skill set to say like, hey, your body's changing or hey, you don't have to PR every time you step out there. I just didn't have that. So instead, it just felt like a massive failure. I mean, I literally hated it at that time in my life. Well, and I was wondering then, why why then are you going to pursue running in college? I think because every time I thought about quitting, I had, and this is throughout my whole career, I had this little voice that would feel like you're going to regret it. You're going to regret it. You're not there yet. And so it totally changed the way I looked at colleges. I wanted to, like before that, I had been to a national high school meet and I thought maybe someday I could be a national champion. And then after my senior year, my junior year into my senior year, I was like, I'm never going to be a national champion, but maybe I could go and, and become a national champion by helping a team. Like maybe I could help a cross-country team win a national title. All of the schools that I had wanted to go to weren't talking to me anyway. And so I totally switched focus. And that's how I ended up at Colorado. I had seen them take second at the National Cross-Country Championship. And they were kind of a ragtag team. Like they didn't have any superstars. And I thought, well, maybe I could help them push them over the edge from second to first. And we did, we did get it done. My last year, we got it done. We were national champions. It was so interesting the way you got into college because you had to, you had to go get it. Nobody was chasing you. No, I literally left messages on answering machines, which also dates me, but that's what I did. I would (laughs) call at night where I knew no one could hang up on me and I would leave a message. So this is the only place where, where your amazing running career and Joe's little running career, uh, intersect Kara. Okay. And that is one of the, I've, I've done a lot of stupid stuff during my life, but one very important thing I did, I thought I had a, a college scholarship to the university of Nevada and on the national signing day, my letter never showed up. So my mom worked at talk about dating you. My mom worked at a, at a church, uh, rectory. And they had a mimeograph machine. There's the dating right there where, where that, you know, with the little blue ink and they'd roll that roller. And so 
I hadn't applied anywhere else. So I had to go to the Peterson's Guide to Colleges and the printer was not hooked up right. So I had to just write down every school in the nation that gave away scholarships. My mom cranked out a bunch of letters. I had to pay for the paper. Then I had to pay for the postage. I ran out of postage, by the way, after A through E and then backwards through University of. So I wasn't going to Florida or Georgia because because they never got a letter from me. But I, I sent all these letters out. And to your credit... And to my credit, I was surprised how many people called back. I was yeah. surprised the fact that you, t- you took control. And because of that, you ended up with a great scholarship. Yeah, I mean, I had a little scholarship. Maybe an okay but scholarship. Still, it was right. it was a reason to go, right? And it was a reason to keep pursuing the sport. And I realized I didn't want to be done. And maybe it wasn't going to look like what I had dreamt it would look like. But I could still go and still be an athlete and still run in college. And yeah, I mean, the answering machine worked. I mean, most people called me back and I ended up going to Colorado, so it worked out. That's fabulous. You you really liked your coach at Colorado. Yes. And, it, and, and I really felt like your coach helped you turn it around and turn your, it really give you self-confidence. How did that happen? Mark believed in me. Mark Wetmore believed in me before I believed in me. I came in my freshman year. I was like, literally like a washed up high school star. And he just looked at me and was like, we're going to take this year by year. And I bought in, I bought in that the improvement would be small, but steady. And I trusted him and everything that he thought I could achieve, I ended up achieving. And I needed someone like that. I needed someone who believed in me, but who wasn't selling me crap. Like, oh, I'm going to turn you around. You're going to run amazing this year. You know, it was like, no, this is going to take time. And I'm so grateful to him. And then I actually got to finish out my career with him as my coach as well, which I'm very grateful for. To see him come back, I thought was really cool. At the end of your career in college, things don't go as well as you want. You were hoping for an agent. You were hoping for offers from shoe companies, your uh, fiance, your husband, by the time you guys graduated husband by then, right? We got married that summer. Got or that married fall. That, that fall, yeah. So Adam is is making ninety thousand dollars with Fila. Was it with Fila? Mm-hmm. And then you get an offer from from Nike. Tell me about getting that. That was that a letter? Was that a phone call? How did that happen? That's a great question. I think I sat with Mark Wetmore and Adam and we wrote up a contract that we thought was fair, and then we probably faxed it to a few different companies. And John Capriati of Nike said, I'll do this deal. And that was that. I was a Nike athlete. It really was, it was a little bit like high school all over again, where I was really struggling mentally. My running was suffering. I felt so much pressure. And I really had a horrible senior year, senior track season anyway. And, you know, I, nobody, no, no one wanted to be my agent. No one was coming after me. And yeah, Adam and Mark and I wrote up a contract, mostly Mark did, that he thought was fair. And we just shopped it. And one company said yes. And that's how I became a Nike athlete. You said $35,000 felt like the world to you. But as a finance guy, Kara, <laughs> I'm like, how is she budgeting? Were you working other jobs while you're... No, but remember, this was 2001. Right. And my then husband owned a property. So I was, you know, I was kind of mooching off him, if I'm being honest. Like he was successful. <laughs> He had signed for $90,000, but he had done so well his first year that he was making a lot more than that in rollover bonuses. And so being married to him allowed me to just be a full-time athlete, which was ridiculous because I was injured and running terribly anyway. But yeah, no, I didn't have to get another job. Well, and while you're injured, you decide that maybe you need to change the scenery. You're looking at going to Wisconsin. Beautiful there. I can't imagine running through those hills. Of course, you were in Colorado, (laughs) so those hills are nothing to you, right? But then you get a call from Nike to be a part of this program. And I just have to imagine, Kara, that just the offer of running for Alberto Salazar had to be just a thrill because everybody, you know, I mean, when I was growing up, that name was just gold. Well, this is kind of funny. And Alberto and I used to laugh about this. I didn't know who he was. You had no idea. Um, (laughs) I had no idea. At one point, I was telling my family, no, he had every American record from the 1500 through the marathon. And he was like, no, I didn't. So this was actually a joke that we used to laugh about. I like Googled him and found out he was a really good marathoner. But no, I didn't know who he was. Adam had heard of him. But I think it was just we went on a visit to the Nike campus and we got to meet some of the other athletes on the Oregon Project. And it was like, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. I mean, like everything's going to be taken care of. We're going to be, I'm going to be talking to people, sports psychologists. That's always been a struggle for me. 
We're going to be getting massage therapy, ART therapy. We have all these modal underwater treadmills, all these crazy things. And if we say no, we're crazy. I mean, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. He's, he's a little unorthodox though, Kara, when you get there. Alberto? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. For people just listening to the audio <laughs> podcast, I just got the, <laughs> the like, are you kidding me? Look. Yeah. Look, this is the thing that's hard is that even with all the bad memories, there's so many good memories. And Alberto is Alberto. And if you know him, you know him. He's very charismatic and he's always trying something new. And he's very, he's, I don't, I don't want to be mean, but he's kind of weird, you know? And, you know, we got there and he immediately brought up Mary Slaney. I hadn't even realized that he coached Mary Slaney when she tested positive. He brought that up right away. I remember Adam and I saying like, what a good guy to like meet us with that. We didn't have to ask about that or find out about it later. But yeah, I mean, we, he showed us all around and it just, again, it felt like if we don't do this, then like, how bad do we want it? This is an incredible opportunity. One of the unorthodox things he does is he has massages that are right in the middle of a co-ed space with everybody. So you write that, uh, you know, the, the guys will get on the table, he'll pull their shorts up. So their ass is hanging out, I think is the term that you used. And then uh, he tells you to get on the table and there's no professionalism. There's no blanket like a professional. He yanks up your, your shorts and now your ass is hanging out in front of everybody. I can't imagine what that felt like. Well, at first it felt like no one's ever done that. First of all, in a massage setting, no one's ever just taken my shorts and tucked them up super high so that my butt was exposed, you know, but no one acted like it was weird. Like everyone's exposed and then everyone else is just sitting around making sandwiches, hanging out, watching ESPN. So it just, again, at the time, I remember Adam and I being like, that's a little weird. But then within a few months, it didn't even cause a single hesitation because that was just Alberto. And that's what he does. That's how dedicated he is to his athletes, that he even gives them massage. Things are going really well in your career. So all of these things, you're sleeping in the weirdest tent I've ever read about, <laughs> this high altitude tent that's super hot. Your sister, I think, was the one that told you that it seemed a little bit like a cult. And I'm reading it. It seems a little like a cult. In a lot of ways, you're kind of cut off. Alberta's telling you the, quote, truth and what you should say about stuff. And really, like looking back on it, does it feel like a cult? Yes, definitely. And I've talked to other people who were in that environment of specifically the Oregon Project. And looking back, we feel like, yeah, we were isolated. We were told everyone was jealous of us. We didn't have a single person that we could talk to on the outside. Everybody was, it was just this ball. And from what I've learned and what I've been told, it was it was very similar to a cult, if not a cult. Boy, it certainly read, read like one to me. You, you run with a, with a younger guy who you said felt a lot like yours and Adam's little brother, a guy named Galen Rupp. I've watched Galen run a ton on television. Tell me a little bit about Galen. Galen is very smart. He's really funny. Um, he was there for me a lot. Um, there were times where, especially leading into the 08 Olympic trials, Adam was at, we were up in Park City training. Adam was at the Olympic Training Center with an injury, Alberta was home and it's just Galen and I, and we got along great and he worked really hard and we were really close. And that was one of the things that was hard about leaving was I felt like I was leaving him behind. But you also realized, Kara, at that time that the, the treatment that Galen's getting while he's in the NCAA is clearly not by the letter of the law, but maybe by the spirit of the law, breaking all these NCAA rules. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, looking back, I feel like that was a red flag that some, you know, like Alberto's thoughts were that some rules were just stupid and the NCAA rule was just stupid. And there's other rules later on that he thought were just stupid. Like it doesn't even matter. Um, and looking back, that was sort of like a little test of our ethical standards and what we thought. I love Galen at the time. I thought he worked really hard. He was not a collegiate athlete. He was up in Park City with us. He was in an altitude tent. He was getting the latest and greatest equipment, right? So clearly rules were being broken. Again, I'm not, a sh I'm not proud, but I kind of just looked the other way and 
when the investigation went on and Alberto asked us to lie, essentially, if we were asked, I just was like, I, I can't. And fortunately, we didn't, we didn't get asked by any investigators about it. And you were surprised that more wasn't made of that at the time. I can't believe that. Like, you can't even find a record of it. It was what it was. And again, I, I don't put the blame on Galen as much as I do the people around him. Um, but it was just sort of swept under the rug as if it, as if it hadn't happened. Yeah, and for people that don't know what Galen was doing, not only is he not on campus in Eugene being coached by the same people, he's being coached by this this coach who's training all pros except Galen. He's down on Nike's campus. He's not being paid, but he's getting access to all of this stuff from a shoe company that other college athletes aren't getting. Your career is going amazingly well. You All the things, that when we introduced you in the open, we went through just all the huge things, Kara, that you did during your career. And even reading about what was going on in your mind during some of those races was super exciting. I'm there with you as you're kicking into another gear that you didn't even know that you had, which was so, so great. But when it comes time for a new, a new contract then, you go from $35,000 to a heck of a lot more money. It was what, $325,000? That's a massive pay raise they gave you. How did you feel about the, the pay raise? And tell me about that. I felt proud. You know, I felt like I deserved that. I had, was coming off of a medal at the World Championships. I knew that we were going to renegotiate because there was interest from other companies. And so my contract wasn't up yet for negotiation, but they agreed to renegotiate early so that I wouldn't leave or be tempted by another offer. My agent at the time, Peter Stubbs, worked really hard to get that deal. And the base was 325 and it had a lot of great bonuses in there as well. And I felt proud. I also felt a lot of pressure because now I'm getting paid as someone who's expected to do well. So it definitely changed the way I looked at racing. You know, before it was kind of like, I'm just crawling the ranks and everything's exciting. And after that, it was like, okay, I have to deliver now because I'm being paid to deliver. Well, and in your book, you talk a lot about the doping scandal and about all the stuff that goes on with doping. And I want to quote you exactly what you write about doping. You say, perhaps it's a bitter irony that in an endurance sport, those on the business side of things don't seem to pay much mind to a runner's long-term career to have health and longevity in a running career. You need enough time to recover after races, but many runners have deals like the one I signed forcing them to not only compete at a set minimum number of races a year, but stay on top of the results table or their risk being dropped. These runners are being told you can't dope. And what you're saying here, Kara is, uh, but if you don't get caught, maybe you'll keep getting paid. Like the risk reward is huge. Right. Well, when you're being held to a standard of, you know, some people have, you have to be top three in the world, or, you know, I think mine was top two in the U S or top 10 in the world. Some people's are even stricter, but now you're saying that, you know, we know there's people doping in the world. We know there's people doping in the U S. So now you're being held to a standard that might not even be realistic. Like you could have the race of your life and run a personal best and finish fifth at the Olympics. And now you're going to get, you face a reduction for that. So what it's, it's not blatantly saying dope. It's just saying, these are the standards we're going to hold you to, even though we know they're not realistic, but that's what you're being held to. Yeah. Yeah. So figure that out, athlete. Yeah, exactly. Good luck. (laughs) How how are you going to do that? Which doesn't make sense to me because I think, I don't know, but I don't run the company. So I, I have no idea. I also don't get the next part, which is they also were very unforgiving when, when you became pregnant. You, you were suspended because you got pregnant. Yeah. Look, Nike knew I was trying to get pregnant. They helped me pick the time. It was an open conversation with my coach of what's the right time to try to have a baby. There was a conversation between my coach and the head of sports marketing of what would happen to my contract. And Alberto came back to me and said, nothing's going to happen. You just need to say relevant. I couldn't even say I was pregnant. Uh, Nike orchestrated the announcement halfway through my pregnancy on Mother's Day on the front page of the sports section of the New York Times. So you can imagine my shock when I found out from my financial advisor that I wasn't getting paid. Because in my mind, I'm doing a million appearances. You are profiting. You're marketing my pregnancy as women can do everything. And yeah, it was a really disappointing time in my life. And it made me realize that the brand that I love so much was not what I thought it was. Well, it made me think of Alison Felix's situation as well. And about uh, all the problems that she had with Nike as well, Kara. I feel like, you know, when Allison was 
a Nike athlete. She's saying all these positive image things. And then you hear Allison talk today and, and the reality was not the same. Right. And that's what's tough because you're still contracted with the brand. So it's not like you can say, you know what? You guys don't represent what I represent because now you're breaking the contract and now you're on the hook to break that contract. But it's you're a contractor. So even if they're like they suspended me without pay, I couldn't say, okay, well, I'm going to run an Adidas for a year until you guys start paying me again. Like if you're if you're a contractor and you have a job and the job isn't working out, you can leave the job and go take another contracting job. But that's not how it is with these contracts. So it you're really stuck. And I, that's one thing I talk about in the book is I felt like I was lying when I would do interviews. I, I mean, I went all the way to Mark Parker, who was the CEO. And I said, I feel like I'm being forced to lie. Everyone's talking about how you supported me. And this is a brand that supports pregnant women. And that's I, you're making me lie. I feel like you're making me lie. It was a really difficult time. When you leave Nike, you're looking for another shoe company and you find Wazelle and you take a meeting with Wazelle. Obviously we're running out of time, but could you briefly talk about going to that first meeting with them? Because this, this feels like you, you're leaving a sauna and there's this breath of fresh air. I just loved the environment. I loved everyone I met. But I also felt embarrassed because they sat me down and they said, well, what do you want to talk about? What are your passions? And I was like, well, what do you guys want to talk about? What are your passions? <laughs> okay, because no one had ever asked me that. In all of my 12 and a half years as a Nike athlete, I was told what was it important seems surreal, right now. like a huge brand like Nike would do that. Yeah, no, but they would tell me what's important. Right now we're doing Flyknit. Right now we're doing sunglasses. Right now we're doing whatever it is. Lunar Glide, whatever it is, like this is what we're doing. No one had ever asked me, like, what do you like? What are you excited about? What makes you feel excited? So I was so embarrassed because I was like, well, I mean, I, I like women, right? You guys like women. I mean, it was so <laughs> pathetic, but it was a huge wake up call for me. I remember when I left thinking, I'm in my mid 30s and I don't know what I care about. And that's a problem. Like I need to really deep dive and figure out who I am because for so long I've just done what everybody tells me to do. And I don't really, I haven't really asked myself, what is it that I want? And what is it that I care about? What was empowering for me and I think will be empowering for people as we close this out is that they say that they can't afford you and you say, make me an offer. Can you tell everybody, because this clearly proves it ain't about the money, Kara, anymore. Tell the, can you tell everybody how much they uh, they paid you? Yeah. So I was making 325 based at Nike. I did get a million dollar contract offer from another company. And Wazelle said, we can't pay. I said, just anything. They offered me 20,000. And I said, done. That was so kick-ass. <laughs> so awesome. Thank you. I just feel like you've given the industry just the finger. It was so good, but it's not about the money. And I feel like now you're back to that little girl in middle school who's, you know, beating the love of her life, Scott. In yeah. <laughs> I mean, the end of my professional career was a bummer because I didn't make the Olympic team, but it was the happiest point of my professional career because I was running because I loved it. I was running with brands that believed in me and didn't, they wanted me to do well, of course, but there was no like, well, if you don't do that, I'm taking away some money. And so I feel so lucky that I got to go out of my career with people that cared about me. And I was running, you know, like The Bachelor, but I really was running for the right reasons. And it was awesome. Throughout this book, whether it worked out or not, it was clear you were always trying to surround yourself with great people. From your grandfather being your coach to your coach at Colorado, frankly, to even going after Colorado versus other schools that didn't have programs like theirs. And then believing that Nike was going to be that next step, like you've always tried to surround yourself with the right people and that resonates. But, but I want to ask about this project in general. You worked on this with one of the most amazing writers, Mary Pallon. Can you talk about that partnership? Like how did you and Mary get hooked up for this? So I, I talked to a lot of different people and everyone I talked to, I was like, oh, I really like them. But when I talked to Mary, I was like, I really like her. She had just enough edge, you know, because we could tell my story, but not put in the money, not put in the details of the, like the incidents between Alberto and I, you could still tell an interesting story where Mary was like, it's all or nothing, Kara. Like it's either we're talking about everything or I'm not doing it. She just became such a close friend. There were times where we would work a few hours a week, multiple days a week together. And there were times where I just like would cry the whole time and like we would get no work done. And she was there for me. And um, I just appreciate her so much because there's no book without her. And she's just an incredible woman. And I think you said this before we started recording, but she is a total, total badass. And I feel really lucky to have her in my life. 
Man, I feel lucky that I know her <laughs> too. So, so I'm with you. I've only interviewed her twice and I'm like, oh, this is awesome. The book is the longest race inside the secret world of abuse, doping, and deception on Nike's elite running team. It's available yesterday wherever books are sold. Um, we we touched the surface, guys. We we touched just the little couple of the highlights. I got one more question. I can't let you go with asking you. You are a new podcaster. You and Des Linden, who, by the way, runs in a place near a guy, Doug. Uh, 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 she's up in Upper Michigan. Doug's in Upper Michigan. He sees Des running by his house all the time. But uh, how did you guys decide to do a podcast? You know what? When she got fourth at the Olympic trials, we both stumbled into the hotel from separate places around midnight. And we looked at each other and we were like, want to go get a beer? And that was the start of a friendship, a loose friendship, because we don't live by each other. And then she was in Boulder um, this past fall and we got a coffee. We were going to meet for like an hour. And then four hours later, we were like, we're starting a podcast. <laughs> and we just <laughs> we were just like, we're going to talk about stuff and we're going to record three episodes. And if nobody likes it, then we'll be done. But if people like it, we're going to keep going. And it seems like people have liked it. So we're going to keep going. I've liked it. It's called Nobody Asked Us. You can listen to that wherever you listen to us now. Kara, I know you got to go. Thank you so much for hanging out with our stackers and giving us this great money lesson that's not always about the cash. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm Liz, the chief mom officer. And when I'm not busy being the breadwinner of my family of five, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Kara Goucher for coming on the show and money, 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 money. money. Hey, let's roll Dave and money. Lifeline. Oh, before that goes any further, don't, don't need any more of that in my life. We're going to tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, OG, they put what you value first. Is it running? Is it distance running? I was thinking about running, but I've started walking which I feel like you should walk before you run. Although, it's, was I talking to you, Doug, where I was walking, but I had a cigar? Yeah, it so was does me. does that count? <laughs> it's like, like, what's that noise I'm hearing? Oh, it's just me trying to light my cigar. I thought you said you're going to go on a walk. No, I'm going to. This is going to be a walk while I have a little, uh, little pe- I need a little pep in my step. What's that noise I hear? Oh, it's just the pizza box opening. <laughs> <laughs> Kara, you ever uh, drink bourbon and run? <laughs> yeah. The beer mile. Yes. Let's do it. Oh, I'm in. Tucker has to do that this weekend. He lost his fantasy football league and he has to do a he, he, he has a choice. He either has to do a beer mile or he has to get tasered. <laughs> no. Yes. Beer mile. He's doing sure. the beer mile, but he doesn't really drink. So they're both going to be. It's a tough choice. Oh, for him. have you been tasered before? It's no choice. <laughs> running running is way better in no matter the condition but carry on joe what, what does haven lifeline have our to friends say about at, this? <laughs> our friends at haven life say it's your loved ones and your time spending time ah, with them which perfect. is far better than getting tasered or <laughs> i'm, I'm sure better. that's what I matt know, wants. you spent a christmas at my house <laughs> i'm sure that's what matt wants in the script haven life better than being tasered better than being tasered <laughs> <laughs> and that's our last read for Haven Life right there. But that's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. You go to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life now for a free quote. Affordable prices, no waiting several weeks for a decision. They've smooth lined the application. It's all online. And of course, they're backed by their parent company, Mass Mutual, more than 160 years old. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to our new friend, Patrick. Hey, Patrick. <laughs> Hi, Joe, N-O, J-J, J-J, G. I recently switched jobs. I would like to know if there are any advantages to keeping my 401k from my old employer where it's at currently, or if it's better to just roll it over to an IRA. I have almost 250000 total split between Roth and traditional. All of my contributions have been Roth since I started contributing in 2014, and I have not rolled any employer contributions over to Roth, so all of that is still traditional. The administrative fees for the 401k are minimal, and the investment options are low-cost Vanguard index funds that I would likely use anyway if I rolled the funds over into an IRA. My wife and I are about 30, and we would like to have full-time employment be optional by 50 or 55. So are there any advantages to keeping my 401k where it's at, or should I roll it into an IRA? Patrick, thanks so much for the question. And we haven't had this one in quite a while, and it's a great, great question. What do you yeah. say to Patrick? 
Really, when you leave your job, you have a couple of different options. So obviously, the first option is if your plan allows, and these are all subject to whether or not the plan allows you to do it. And some of them have account minimums. Some of them will have costs associated with it if you want to do. But the first option is to leave it. So kind of what he's talking about here, I've got a good plan. It's got the investment choices I like. It doesn't seem to cost much. I'm happy where it is. Uh, you can leave it if your company plan allows you to do that. The second option is the other thing that he's talking about, which is to take it out, roll it into uh, an IRA or to a Roth IRA. Patrick's case, he'd have one of each because he's got Roth money and IRA money. Benefit there is that it's accessible to you. It's from a liquidity standpoint, if you you know happen to need it for whatever reason. There's different choices from an investment perspective. Um, also, the cost could be better or the same, at least, as what the 401k plan is. Sometimes it's easier if you have other money. You know, you have a portfolio of regular investments at Fidelity, and you can put your 401 or make your 401k roll over to an IRA at Fidelity. Easier to manage. The other option is you can put it in the new plan at the new company, which is an option he didn't bring up, which is can I take the old 401k and put it in the new 401k? And a lot of plans will allow you to do that. I think the things that he's thinking about there are, are the pieces that you would want to evaluate. You know, what's the cost structure? What's the ease of use? The biggest problem that we see with people that leave plans in old 401k locations is that if it's a small amount, maybe you change jobs kind of back to back, is we forget about them. And you go, I will never forget about my $20,000 at Chicken Express when I was there when I was 15. That's a lot of money. It's like, yeah, you will. When you have $2 million in your 401k at your other company and you've moved six times, they will lose track of you and you will forget how to log in and you know, and it just will kind of fade away. And then you've lost that money. I doubt that you'd forget about 250,000. So, so I don't think that's a real issue for Patrick unless he's got, you know, two and a half billion or something laying around, then, then, then maybe you forget about 250 K, but a little different than losing $10, <laughs> yeah. 10, 10 bucks finding in your jeans. Oh yeah. Look. Yeah. Um, there's some other considerations too, I think in terms of like, how does the other plans, how's the other stuff that you have going on in your life from an investment standpoint, stack up with the tool that you have with the old plan. If you, are trying to build a cohesive investment strategy, sometimes you don't have all of the options available to you in the plan that you have. Again, in Patrick's case here, it sounds like maybe he does, or he's at least satisfied with the options that he has. So these are all the things that you would want to consider. And the last thing is that I would say is some of the distribution rules are different between IRAs and 401ks, especially around that early retirement. So if you're thinking about using some of this money pre 59 and a half, you want to be aware of which one gives you the most flexibility. But the cool thing is, is that at 30, you don't have to make that decision now. There's probably going to be changes anyway between now and 50. So I really wouldn't stress what the rules are today because, you know, you got 20 years to solve that problem. But that's a consideration as well. Thanks for the question, Patrick. If you've got a question like Patrick had, go to stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail. And you know what? We will make it worth your while. We will send you a Haven Life Greatest Money Show on Earth circus t-shirt, which is uh, fantastic. Doug, you've been uh, telling our stackers in our Facebook group to put some of those online. We've had a couple people take you up on it. Yeah, we got one from New Zealand. That was awesome. And she'd been in, in Antarctica. I noticed there was no t-shirt picture. From Antarctica. <laughs> From Antarctica. She waited till she got to New Zealand or she's like, it's in the fifties. It might be too warm. Isn't that what she said? So Amanda, and then we've got Tyson in the Arctic circle who share stuff. So we have listeners, community members from North pole all the way to the South pole and all parts in between 47 countries. That's pretty amazing. That's really, really cool. It is when Tyson showing us the Northern lights and Amanda's taking a break from from Antarctica. Tyson Tyson in Antarctica or in uh Anchorage? Is that where he is? No. No, he's in the Arctic Circle. He's he's north of there on an installation. Yeah. Say, Anchorage is like ten miles north of me. <laughs> well I mean it north. sounds impressive when you say I'm in Anchorage, Alaska, but I mean if you just draw a line horizontally, it's like the next county up from me. Oh, whatever. Stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail if you want to brag totally about true. where you're from. Oh, okay. To us and ask and ask a question to the Haven Lifeline. I'm a latitude bragger. <laughs> Do you know where I've been? 
Hey, uh, speaking of where we've been, by the way, we've got some good stuff coming up here. Tonight, I will be headed north to the Economy Conference. If you're there, stop by and say hi. Doc G and I are doing a meetup, OG, at uh, my favorite microbrewery in town called Taft's Ale House. Baby, they took a church. If you've ever wondered. The next time we're there, Doug, we got to go there because church. this place is amazing. They took a church and they turned it into an ale house. It was an old abandoned boarded up church. And it is the most beautiful place. And Cheryl and I, the first time we went there after we were told about it, there was a choir singing uh, from the area that had been the altar, which, by the way, instead of the altar, I don't know if this is sacrilegious because Definitely the church going to is... Definitely hell for whatever you're about to say. Yeah. The church has already not been a church before, but where the altar was are these huge tanks now full of beer. So do with that what you will. But it's a beautiful venue. The event is sold out. However, if you just come hang out at the bar, as soon as uh, as soon as soon the, what, hour and a half time frame's over, we're just going to take over the whole place. So come join us if you're in Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Tomorrow night. WKRP. Tomorrow night. All right. That's going to do it for today, except for one thing, which is I know a lot of people come to a show like ours because you're worried about the economy. You're worried about our headline today, uh, which is that the job market might be slowing down. You might be worried about a lot of stuff. And if you're feeling anxious to make some moves in your finance, what I'd like you to do instead is check out this free guide OG and his team have put together that'll help you plan more and panic less, no matter what the market does. It's got some great insights on what you should be doing and smart questions to ask yourself so that you'll make financial decisions that your future self will thank you for. And to get that, you head to stackingbenjamins.com slash guide. That's stackingbenjamins.com slash guide. All right. That's our community calendar. Hope to see a lot of you in Cincinnati. But right now, Doug, I got a question for you, man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, take some advice from Kara Goucher. Sometimes it's not about the money. Don't be afraid to speak up and tell your story. Second, looking for a job? Look to your network. And if you're not yet looking for work, make that network more robust now so you're not scrambling later. But the big lesson? Mall walking is hard. You gotta, like, really get to Kara Goucher's level on this stuff to both be able to crank your hips but not drop your Cinnabon. I mean, a coffee too? That's totally next level. Thanks to Kara Goucher for joining us today. You can run and grab the longest race inside the secret world of abuse, doping, and deception on Nike's elite running team at bookstores near you. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Lacey Langford, who's also the host of The Military Money Show, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find The 411 on all things money at The 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Yunkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show.
Welcome to the after show. Normally I play a clip of the movie that we're about to talk about. And by the way, if you're new here at the end of the show, we have this lovely hidden track every time that we call the after show. You can call it dessert if you want to talk about it. Otherwise, just don't talk about it and we're good. It's fun for people to find on their own. However, we talk about all things non-money. So if you're here for money stuff, we'll just catch you next time. But normally, as I was saying, I, I will often play a clip of the movie that I saw or that maybe that Doug or OG saw. This movie, I saw the new Ant-Man movie, guys. I saw the new Ant-Man. And you know what? It sucked. It was the same crap that Marvel puts out over and over and over. So I don't even want to play the trailer because I want this to just go away. Whatever happened to good guy fights bad person or good person fights bad person in the world as we have it, this whole idea of these quantum realms and a whole damn movie that's in front of a green screen in these weird universes with these strange creatures like this. Okay. I get that it's comic books, but we're so far from Batman and Superman and just the basic stuff. It is just so weird. It's gotten so weird. They're fighting this entire movie in the quantum realm. What the hell's the quantum realm? And why do I care? I was going to go down the path of like, I'm really ticked off that my auto insurance has gone up a whole bunch, but no, I like this better. Yes. This oh, is I a- die on this hill. This is a way bigger hill. <laughs> I, <can tell. laughs> I, I agree. It is, it is so stupid. So you know what my, the- my question is when you, when you got the ticket to Ant-Man, were you expecting it to be a well, Oscar winner. Like we're well, like, this is, well, this is no, going to be yeah. the Marvel yes. movie where they break the mold. It's got Paul Rudd. Everybody likes Paul Rudd. Yeah. I love Who Paul doesn't? Rudd. I think Paul Rudd's awesome. Michelle Pfeiffer's in it. Oh, yeah. Michael Douglas is in it. Michael Douglas. He's like 85. Yeah, he is 85 and he's in it. Oh. All right. Cool. So you were expecting a nomination for best picture overall. And Evangeline Lilly's in it. Like, just, I don't know, just a, just a great cast. Yes. Uh, uh, no, I was not expecting that, but oh, gee, I was expecting, I was expecting not to just be completely let down. And in fairness, I probably wouldn't have even gone to see it, but a good friend of mine actually bought me a ticket and was nice. Cheryl was out of time. He's like, Hey, you want to go see it man with me? I'm like, yeah, it'll just be fun to go hang out with my buddy, Rick. And then Rick texts me and goes, okay, I bought your ticket when I was buying ours online. Like, oh, well, let me pay. Nope. You're not paying me back. So it makes me feel a little bad saying, hey, I went to see Ant-Man for free. I'm a good buddy. Thank you to my buddy. It was very nice. But the movie blew. And by the way, I was starting to say this earlier. You know what the takeaway is? Literally the takeaway of the movie. I'm going to go ahead and blow this, blow this up for everybody. Spoiler alert. Being a short man sucks. Almost, Doug. Seriously. Almost that bad. It's never too late to not be a d- And by the way, those are exact words. That is the theme of the movie. It's never too late to stop being a dick. Just come on. Come on. Oh.